speaker is my good friend John Barrows, who actually started off here as a volunteer museum docent. And it wasn't hard to tell right away that he was one of the good ones. And to let you in on a little secret, John, I'm not even sure that I um, ever told you this, but we nicknamed him Radio John before we knew his last name. And you'll see why, because he has a really great voice. Anyway, um, while John's not volunteering for us, he's created an incredible online resource called the Monmouth Timeline, and you can access that at monmouthtimeline.org. It not only documents all the major events in Monmouth County, but it's led him to ask unanswered questions and deeply investigate these stories. I've just been so impressed with what he's accomplished, and I know he's going to impress you as well. So without further ado, please welcome John Barrows. Thanks, Dana. And thanks to everybody at the Monmouth County Historical Association for putting on this great historically speaking series. Uh, I know I've learned a lot from it. And it's just one of the other amazing great programs that MCHA puts on that makes it such a great asset to our community. So let's get on with it now. Um, so what is the Monmouth Timeline anyway? Well, it's a web page and it's a collection of the best stories of 400 years of regional history. It's uh, right now we're up to about 220 stories. They're uh, organized across many different categories, including ships and shipwrecks, heroes and celebrities, science, sports, the Revolutionary War, you name it. And it's designed to be uh, uh, searchable. Um, it has lots of subcategories. In fact, we have a history timeline for every one of the incorporated boroughs and townships in Monmouth County. And uh, uh, all of this is organized so it can be searched by keyword or by date or by century or what have you. And so it's meant to be uh, both something that's fun uh, to just browse around and, and learn about history, but also a resource for, um, for educators and uh, um, researchers. And um, one of the things people find fun is you can, you can surf around by just hitting the random event and just to find a different kind of a moment in history anytime you want. So with that, uh, we, the best of these stories that we put out uh, every year, uh, we, we put on, on graphic features that are called This Day in Monmouth County History. And so uh, we issue these via Facebook, as well as uh, 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 Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we did about 73 of these last year. We're on track to about do the same uh, again. And uh, another exciting thing we're doing now is uh, we started an art initiative. It was designed to help uh, bring new illustrations to some of our greatest stories. And it was born out of the realization that some of the most amazing stories from our history have no images whatsoever. No one's even sketched anything. And we decided that we would be proactive and start um, you know, locating young artists who are interested in uh, uh, illustrating history and commissioning new works. And the very first of the ones that we put out on this is the one you see here, which is uh, the uh, meeting in Red Bank when Booker T. Washington uh, came to meet with uh, the publisher T. Thomas Fortune. And we didn't have any kind of a photo or a sketch or anything, so we had this commission so that people could imagine what that meeting looked like. And the second of our commissioned art, works of art is um, about wreckers, and you will see that later in this uh, presentation. And now, three curious stories from the Monmouth Timeline. So let's start with a man who needs no introduction. Brief timeline of Thomas Alva Edison in Monmouth County. Well, I am obliged to introduce him anyway. He was uh, born in Ohio um, in 1931. He was mostly self-taught. Uh, certainly secondary education was self-administered. And he lived most of his um, adult life um, in uh, West Orange, New Jersey, in that general area. And he is known for inventing a few things that have affected our lives. Um, and he had almost 1,100 patents. So um, he is, of course, a, a legend um, in, in American history. And um, almost all of uh, what you see him accomplishing here um, was before his 60th birthday. And what we're going to talk about is what happened after his 60th birthday um, in the latter stages of his career. And so uh, what happened is the, um, the United States Navy has approached uh, uh, Thomas Edison about submarine batteries. And um, he's, uh, at this time he's 63 years old. The problem with submarine batteries in those days is if they leak, they can create a poisonous gas in, which can kill the entire crew instantly. So submarines are, um, are, are very much a competitive defense uh, tactic that uh, America wants to um, master. They can't get the batteries down, so they turn to Edison. And he's more than happy to help because he knows a defense contract is good business. He can fix it. He can make money off it. So he takes on the assignment. But like, like, like everything Edison does, he's one of the world's great multitaskers. He doesn't focus solely on submarine batteries. He, he works on that just the same time he's working on six or seven other things at the same time. So um, what happens is 
Um, as, as the run-up to World War I is happening, German submarines are causing a lot of havoc around um, the world. And um, in particular, the sinking of the Lusitania really affected Edison um, and uh, you know, the fact that it was clear that, uh, that uh, a world war was brewing. And um, so that led Edison to um, go to the Navy and propose cre the creation of a Naval Research Laboratory, um, a think tank, a, a, a place where the greatest minds uh, uh, inventors, technicians could all come together and take on the great defense challenges for the United States. And um, he th thought that the absolute perfect place to build it was in Sandy Hook, um, uh, because among other things, we can imagine that that would have allowed him to uh, keep some uh, tabs on some of his other um, projects while he was uh, working um, for the government. And um, so um, he proposed this uh, and um, the Navy said, uh, I love the idea, not so crazy about Sandy Hook. So March 7th, 1917, Edison threatens to quit. He tells the government, I'm not going to do this at all if I don't have my facility built on Sandy Hook. And this is a man who is not accustomed to getting his way. This man is used to getting his way. Not this time. Uh, so what happens is he gets sick and, um, and, and nothing happens for a while. And the Secretary of the Navy realizes he can't afford to lose Thomas Edison. And so he goes to Edison and says, look, you know what your projects, you want to know, you know what you want to be working on. Let's get you working. Don't worry about this, this facility. That'll happen or it won't. It'll be here, it'll be there, whatever. That's going to happen but over time. We need to get you working. I'm, I'm going to give you a ship. I'm going to let you pick a hand-picked crew. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So they set Edison up with a, um, a patrol boat and uh, they set him up with some uh, facilities south of Fort Hancock on Sandy Hook. And uh, in 1917, he began um, uh, conducting experiments all across uh, Raritan Bay and uh, in our region. Uh, and he uh, ends up, uh, he spent his days at the Globe Hotel in Red Bank, where even though he was one of the most famous people in the entire world, um, nobody recognized him, nobody made any uh, big deal, and uh, nobody wrote any newspapers or articles about it. But it was a time of war, people were keeping their mouths uh, closed uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and so Edison and his team came up with um, almost four dozen different uh, ideas for the Navy. And they aren't all inventions. They're not all gadgets and gears. Some of our processes or systems, an underwater surveillance uh, 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 platform, um, a special kind of lubricant to, for a, a submarine deck gun that's going to spend a lot of time underwater in salt water. Uh, and all these different kinds of ideas and, and uh, Edison sent on to the Navy. And the Navy used, well, how many do you think the Navy used? They used zero, not one, not one idea that America's great genius inventor sent to the Navy got used. And they sent him apparently patiently and detailed responses for every, each and every one of these explaining why, but it infuriated him because he's a man who is not used to getting his way. I was used to getting his way, I'm sorry. And so what Edison ends up doing is he quits the whole research in, in Monmouth County moves to Washington just to lobby for the ideas he's already submitted. Um, that goes nowhere. He finally throws his hands up and moves to Key West. Eventually, the patrol boat joins him down there, and he continues doing things. But by then, the war is over, and he has very little to show for his time serving the government. And so one of the curious things about this story is that for as famous a man as Edison is, to spend that kind of time in and around Monmouth County, we think a lot more of, of, of us who are history buffs would know about this, we have heard this story, it would be anthologized in more places and whatnot. Um, but this might be the reason, this is my guess is why the reason is that, that more people don't know about this story. I don't know how many of the recent biographies of Thomas Alva Edison you've read in the last 15 years. This is not all of the biographies, this is just all the ones in the last uh, 15 years that were aimed at adults. And um, well, you know, they, um, boy, they don't look very different, do they? Uh, there's nine books and four of them use one photo and two of them use another photo and they all look exactly the same. So if you didn't read all of these, you're not to be blamed. But the one that you might have missed was this last one. Edmund Morris, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, uh, did this amazing work on, on Edison that came out in 1990, but Morris died before the book was published. So it came up posthumously, but that meant no big publicity campaign no great book signing tour in which the publicists would have been able to pull little gems of local history out um, and, and in which case this would have probably have been a story everyone would have known instead of um, hardly anybody and so uh, 
That is uh, Thomas Edison. Let's go on to our next story. Wreckers, the land pirates of Monmouth County. And no, that is not a picture of Monmouth County. That's the Sealy Islands and Corwall, which is one of the other great shipwreck prone areas of the world in which um, people on land who uh, tried to give assistance uh, ended up uh, being smeared as among the most rapacious uh, and awful people on the planet. So let's define our terms. What do we mean by wreckers? Well, today we have the Coast Guard, right? If you're in a ship close to shore and you're in trouble, the Coast Guard, you're, you're in luck because the US Coast Guard is an incredible asset. And I'm not just saying that because my father was in the Coast Guard. Uh, but before there was a Coast Guard, there was something called the U.S. Life Saving Service, and that was one of three federally funded services, uh, including the Lighthouse Service and the Revenue Cutter Service. Uh, the Life Saving Service was the organization, federally funded service that organized uh, rescue efforts from land uh, to help ships at sea. And you see a famous uh, 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 saving of, of, of uh, almost all but one of the passengers from the famous shipwreck off Monmouth County called the Air Shear, the Life Saving Service. But before there was a Life Saving Service, if your ship was in trouble close to shore, your life depended on wreckers and possibly your cargo and livelihood and passengers as well. So what we're talking about is the age of sail. Um, and this was a very, very dangerous time. Um, there were a lot of things that could go wrong on, on ships at this time. This is Lloyd's Register of Shipping uh, that, that tracks the different ways uh, things can go wrong on a ship. So this is not everything that can go wrong on a ship. This is just the things that go wrong on ships. So frequently, Lloyd's felt that they needed to keep track of them. So there were those that were abandoned at sea, foundered, missing, broken up, condemned, burnt, collision, wrecked, lost, war losses. So what we have is um, uh, a lot of ways that uh, it's almost a miracle that any sailing vessel uh, ever reached its, its uh, uh, port of destination um, safely. Uh, so ships got in trouble for a lot of different reasons. And what happened in those days was uh, it was supposed to be a mutual beneficial arrangement. So for the people on uh, for the people on the ship, you're close to shore and you're in big trouble. And you know, uh, there's people on shore, they can help and they're willing to help. Uh, and um, their first priority is to save the lives of the, of the, of the captain and crew and passengers. Second priority is to save the valuables and the cargo if possible, and the third is the ship. Uh, sometimes the ship isn't uh, so badly damaged, it can't be um, floated and fixed and sail again someday. So the idea is that the people on land will render these this kinds of assistance. You avoid certain death and a complete total loss of, of your cargo, and the people on shore receive some sort of compensation. So that's how the system is supposed to work. Uh, it was supposed to be synergistic, in reality, it, it really often was not. And uh, what over the um, over the uh, centuries, really, um, those locals who engaged in this in those parts of the world where shipwrecks were very prone um, were called wreckers, and they were accused of three heinous crimes. And uh, uh, this is around the world, but this uh, was, we're going to see this is going to happen to the people in Monmouth County as well. The first is called inducement, and this is the idea of lighting fires or, or doing things to lure ships to sail towards dangerous reefs or rocks or sandbars to intentionally make them crash so that they can be plundered for loot and cargo. Um, in fact, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so the second accusation is the failure to assist survivors. This relates to a law that existed in the United Kingdom very briefly, was repealed fairly quickly, but you know, in those days, people don't know about laws living or dying. You know, the law essentially held that if a ship was in trouble, if one single person survived, there was a different set of rules for salvaging that than if there were no survivors at all. And that gave rise to stories and myths that uh, wreckers were um, uh, treating survivors with um, uh, murderous intent, that uh, uh, survivors were being met with clubs and fists if they were lucky enough to reach shore. Uh, if, uh, if, if, some, if, if people were able to get off a ship and get into a boat, they might find the boat pushed back out to sea instead of drift so that the people on land could claim that they found the vessel abandoned and uh, keep all of its contents. Um, and um, the third accusation was of the plundering of cargo. Now, this gets into everything um, from flotsam, and that's the, that's the stuff that's floating around in the water, uh, the jetsam, that's the stuff that floats up on the beach, and uh, the third one that is lesser known, which is lagan, and that's the stuff that's lying on the bottom of the ocean floor. So this is all the stuff that used to be in the ship, used to belong to the ship's owners or, or uh, uh, sponsors. And um, now it's in various places where other people can get it. And that's all 
Uh, all of that's regulated uh, largely by um, uh, admiralty law or, or, or maritime traditions. But in these faraway parts of the world, um, those kinds of laws don't always um, uh, uh, come into play. So of these three acquisition, ac accusations, they've been looked into at great detail by other historians. And the fact is that there's no evidence that this inducement has ever happened. One historian looked at every single uh, um, records case that came before the Admiralty Court in Key West, and not one captain ever claimed to have been induced into a wreck. And this makes sense, because if you think about it, if you're on a ship and you see a light on shore, what does that light mean? Does it mean come closer or does it mean stay away? Lighthouses are all places that ships to stay away from. So the whole notion that you would light a, a fire or a light and ships would go towards it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Second one, same thing. No evidence this ever really happened. It made for a good story, but there was no evidence that it ever actually happened. Now, what you tend to happen sometimes, and we will see this coming up later, is there's a very big a difference in perspective of the people who are on a ship close to shore that, is, that has gone over a reef, and th th they may be facing certain death, and then they, and they see there's people on shore. To the people on the boat, it, it looks like the people on shore could really save the day if they just tried. They just had the gumption. They could, they could do something about it. The people on shore are saying, it's certain death if we try to help you. If we go into that water, we will all die. And that doesn't help anybody. So that little misunderstanding, the people on shore rarely got the benefit of it out in those situations. Um, but that's not the same thing as failing to help the people who do make it to shore alive. And then the third one, the plundering of the cargo. Uh, yeah, this probably happened a lot. But again, you were talking about highly impoverished parts of the world, the end of land, Cornwall, um, uh, the, 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 the Florida Keys before in the, in, in the colonial age. Um, uh, these are, these are, are impoverished communities far away from any kind of help from government. And, and what you have is a situation where sometimes literally um, good fortune washes up right at your feet, and what are you going to do about it? And, um, you know, the old finders keepers thing, it's, it's still to this day, people don't really understand what are the legalities. If I find something, I can keep it. And um, that was uh, no different um, along the uh, coastlines. So um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, this is, this is the uh, original illustration that we commissioned um, from artist Charles Swerdlow. has the same title as his presentation, Rutgers the uh, land pirates of Monmouth County. And the idea here was to imagine what it would be like to be on a ship in trouble, close to shore, if all of those accusations were true. And so what you see in the upper left is the bonfire that the locals lit that convinced the captain that he was close to his port and had him turn towards shore and, and, uh, and ran onto the rocks or the sandbar. And then the second thing, uh, a failure to, um, uh, to assist survivors. Well, you see the people close to shore being clubbed and you see blood in the water. You see uh, in, the, in the boat that's coming out. Um, is, that, is, that, is that boat coming out to rescue people or is it coming out to take anything that can be taken away? Um, again, uh, this is designed to uh, um, sort of imagine what inducement looked like, um, what the uh, failure to aid survivors might have looked like. And then if you look at the shore, you see you know, horses and wagons and people carrying things away, and that would be the plundering of cargo. So uh, it's a pretty scary uh, time. And um, you can imagine that uh, emotions run high. And um, uh, so uh, this is, this is um, taking a look uh, at, at the, at the um, North American colonies. There were five original regions um, uh, that, that were, that were uh, most prone to shipwreck, shipwrecks. Um, and, and they were the uh, Sable Island, which is 150 miles off of Halifax, um, the entrance to Boston Harbor uh, around uh, Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, uh, the entrances to New York Harbor, including uh, Long Island Sound and uh, the Jersey Shore, Outer Banks, and the Caribbean. And that in the Caribbean there, that's both the uh, Straits of Florida north of Cuba, as well as the passages west of the Bahamas that led from um, Caribbean islands to mainland U.S. Wreckers operated in different ways uh, in these different areas. Uh, in places like the Caribbean and Sable Island, they were independent contractors. Uh, and so uh, they were all, um, you know, the, the, the wreckers of, of the Keys would um, spend the night in safe uh, harbors, and then they would sail out each morning and sail up and down the 200 miles of the Florida Keys uh, and, and see what ships had blown onto the reef overnight. Um, and the first ship to get to a wreck, that uh, the captain of that um, record uh, ship, he gets to be wreck master. 
That means he takes charge of the marine salvage of that vessel. He's in charge of coordinating the resources. So all of the other wreckers that want to be there, they get to get a share if they're willing to help. And the wreck master coordinates, you know, how many people do I need? Who has the right kind of vessel? What do I need? Uh, they uh, are in charge of cataloging the goods that are salvaged. They're in charge of uh, 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 cataloging and taking sure that the um, captain and crew and passengers are cared for. Um, any, the, you know, the ship can be towed and saved. If any of the, uh, uh, the cargo can be saved. Um, if there's any dispute over how to split that up with, um, with the ship's owners and captains, then uh, the wreck master has to bring all that to the Admiral Key Court, and um, that's where those disputes are adjudicated. So for, for, uh, for, for years, for decades, all the newspaper coverage of wreckers in, in the colonies, in, in, in the United States, the early American colonies, was very bland. Now, these days of early new American newspapers, shipping news is big news. Um, everything that came and went from the colonies came by ship. Um, and so um, vessels um, arriving and leaving um, was uh, the primary area of coverage of um, newspapers. And um, so uh, there's a lot of coverage of records in these newspapers. And, and most of it is very brief, one or two sentences. And the positive stories are typically along the lines of uh, a, a ship was seen blown onto the reef uh, outside Caicos and records were seen nearby saving the crew and uh, cargo. So when you hear words like saving, you know that generally it looks like it was a positive um, experience. Negative stories tend to be that uh, some of these um, misunderstandings. And this a lot of times when a, you know, a ship gets blown on to the sandbar of the reef and the storm blows over and the next day the sun's out but the ship is in six feet of water, the captain is still there, maybe the crew's still there and the wreckers are there to help. And the captain does it, the captain wants to negotiate. He doesn't want to just turn the whole thing over to the wreckers and you can understand his point of view, but he doesn't have any basis to negotiate. So if you're the wreckers, you're like, what do you have to offer? You know, we're, are you going to walk home? You're, 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 you know, you're a thousand miles of water from where you're supposed to be. Uh, so uh, the, a lot of the negative stories tended to be where a captain tried to, you know, make sense and they wouldn't hear of it. And, and, uh, um, and uh, somebody was left with their knickers in a twist. Um, but um, at, at any rate, uh, the news coverage was very, very consistent, very brief, mostly positive, mostly neutral, some negative. And then we come to 1834, great hoax of 1834, capture of land pirates. This is a story that appears out of nowhere. When we say out of nowhere, I mean, we looked at every single newspaper story about records from 1700, I think the earliest one was 1743, all the way up to 1834, with every single one of them. And they all had a certain consistency. And this one was different in every way, shape and form. And it is, uh, um, is, it is in, in particular far longer than any article about records that has ever appeared. And it is far more detailed. It names names, it names people, it gets into law enforcement, uh, and, and, um, and, it, and it details the plundering of, of four different shipwrecks um, in and around Barnegat Inlet, which was, of course, part of, of Monmouth County at that time. So the story appeared in, in New York Gazette. Which was a morning paper, and uh, and I said for by far the longest, most detailed ever about wreckers, um, and uh, uh, focusing on four shipwrecks that appeared over a two-year period, um, 1832 to 1834. Uh, this story went and repeated all three of those heinous accusations. So of uh, th those four ships, there they were uh, some they were induced to their wrecks. Uh, some of the survivors were murdered, corpses robbed, and uh, cargoes plundered. The, the story talks about. A hundred men with blackened faces boarding these ships in the middle of the night, threatening the crew with their lives if they interfered, so that they could take off in their boats with their uh, with their plundered cargo. And uh, a judge in New York, Judge Betts, assigned a, um, an agent named Huntington to go into New Jersey and break up this band of pirates and place them under arrest and put them in jail in Newark where they could face trial. Uh, and uh, and 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 those that couldn't be arrested were were scared off into the woods where they were never seen or heard from again. And uh, so but this story, well, that's a really, well, that's a heck of a story, but it wasn't picked up by very many other newspapers. Again, in this time, at this time in history, the great majority, the, the vast majority of newspaper content is stuff from other newspapers. Probably 75, 80 percent of what you read in this newspaper today, it's all stories that were in some other newspaper yesterday or the day before. So this is an incredible story. It's very different, very salacious. and 
Only about 20 other newspapers carried it. One of them was the New York Evening Sun, and they carried it that same day. So they didn't really give it a lot of thought. They just ran with it. But the fact is that um, not very many other newspapers carried it. Um, and those that did, pretty much mostly smaller papers. A lot of newspapers in Vermont uh, and Pennsylvania, um, as opposed to New York City and Philadelphia, um, carried this story. So that's why we believe it's a hoax. It didn't last very long within the last uh, appearance of this story was just a few months uh, after it first appeared. So it's just it's, everything about it says it's a hoax. Why do we say, you know, why do we say that? Well, uh, only like I said, only about 20 new, other newspapers picked it up. It should have been picked up by 100 easily. Uh, and uh, here's another thing. None of this stuff when it happened, if it happened for real, was newsworthy in New Jersey. So at the time we have daily newspapers in Red Bank. Freehold, Long Branch, and Asbury Park, and not one of those four newspapers ever wrote anything about those four shipwrecks that suggested there was anything amiss about it. So for some reason, it was big news in New York City, not in New Jersey. I don't believe it. Uh, and now the other thing is, you know, today we look at newspapers in the past from the prism of the present, where uh, at least today newspapers claim uh, as much as possible that they're putting forth uh, um, the unvarnished truth. Well, they weren't making any such claims in, in the in the 18, in 1834. It, it was uh, it was called the penny press. It had become one of the most uh, popular forms of entertainment, and, and fact and fiction were routinely blended all the time, and that was just the normal way of things. Um, and here's a newspaper hoaxes, not an uncommon thing. There were plenty of them. One of the most famous ones was the New York the New York Sun. Uh, uh, discovering a colony of, of people living on the moon, and they ran with that for three weeks, and and it was that was a story that got picked up by newspapers all across the country, and it was obviously complete nonsense. Um, and there's a, another famous uh, story from a few years later about a publisher of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle uh, distributing a forged Associated Press story about uh, President Abraham Lincoln, in which um, Lincoln apologized for his failures and and uh, weaknesses, and it triggered a stock market collapse, in which the publisher of the Daily Eagle made a killing, which wasn't against the law at the time. So these people were not above manipulating um, the, the press for other purposes. So, uh, there, you know, of, of the, uh, and then the, uh, the other thing is that this, as I said, this story has an enormous number of specific details and I'm not gonna go into them all here because we don't have time, but I'm gonna tell you not one, you take every one of those claims, not one of them holds up um, uh, as fact. Uh, so um, uh, further, uh, so here's some of those specifics. Mentions Judge Betts as the judge that sent the, um, uh, the agent in uh, to arrest people in New Jersey and take them to jail in Newark and, and put them on trial in Newark. Well, Judge Betts was a real person, but he was a New York circuit court judge. And New Jersey had its own circuit court. And the whole point of circuit courts was so you didn't have judges in one state doing things in other states. So that isn't true. Garrett D. Wall was, in fact, the attorney general of New Jersey at one time. But not when this, not in 1834 when this happened, or in those two years when these shipwrecks happened. So that's proven untrue. Um, the story goes on at great length about a, a wreckmaster called William Platt. Now, again, Monmouth County or and, and uh, area of New York, the wreckers operate a little differently from the Caribbean because they're it's such a highly populated area, so close to a major port. Um, rather than have independent contractors compete to see who could um, uh, uh, render assistance. Um, states would appoint um, official rec masters as paid public servants, and that was the case in um, in, in Monmouth County and in New Jersey. And we will we will hear more from him. Uh, but his, uh, in this article in the New York uh, Gazette, uh, went on at great length that the uh, one of the people responsible for coordinating um, the, the plunder of the, the shipwrecks was in fact the rec master, who was also the justice of the peace, um, a man named William Platt, and. Uh, that's not true. Um, another person um, was the wreck master. And uh, uh, supposedly in this story, William Platt had fled uh, New Jersey to go to Indiana to avoid arrest. Well, there was a man from New Jersey in Indiana who was facing legal troubles, but he wasn't involved with plundering cargo. Uh, what he was was um, uh, he had failed to show up for a court appearance uh, to uh, address his wife's divorce proceedings. And he had uh, faced a um, court summons were said, if you don't show up, we're going to adjudicate this case without you. But um, so it's very, very strange that there's all these specifics and none of them hold any water whatsoever. And again, this is a story that talks about multiple people being arrested, taken to jail or being chased away and never heard from again. 
but there are no, there's nothing in any public records about any arrests, any trials, or any convictions, or any disappearances, for that, for that matter. And every one of the specific names, we did, we did newspaper searches where all the specific names, like a Holcomb Everingham, who did this and that, took 20 years before and 20 years after, they don't show up anywhere. That's not conclusive, but it's highly suggestive. So that, then there's official documents. Well, when you have official formal records and spurious newspaper stories, who are you going to believe? So let's talk about our rec master, John S. Foreman, a very old Monmouth County family. And uh, he was the official commissioner of recs. That was his formal title. He was a number of things. He, uh, he was, um, besides rec master from Monmouth County, which he did for 30 years. Uh, so he was there before and after some of this and Platt was supposedly there, but he was there during that time. Uh, he held up. He wore a lot of hats. He was a he was a just he was a justice of the peace. He was a judge. Uh, he was a farmer, and he was an innkeeper. And uh, uh, his father was a rec master. And his son uh, took up uh, was appointed rec master after him, and he kept very careful records. Those records are available and can be viewed at Monmouth County Historical Association. Here's one of them. This is an inventory of the cargo ship General Putnam. This is the General Putnam was one of the four ships that uh, was mentioned in the Gazette article as having been plundered by the land pirates uh, of Barnegat. Well, if a hundred men boarded that ship in the middle of the night and carried off all of its cargo, where did all this stuff come from that John S. Foreman is showing was offloaded and, and then sold at auction? And, and it, it lists the names of the people um, that it was sold to. Again, very meticulous records. Uh, you, 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 know, you can't have two versions of this story. Uh, now, for example, again, with the General Putnam, shh, this is an account book um, of those uh, locals in and around Monmouth County who came down to help John Foreman salvage the, the General Putnam. They were paid for their trouble. This was a book that, that kept account of who came down and how many days and what they did and what was owed them. So again, very meticulous records. Um, obviously, no one from the New York Gazette knew that. Um, here's another one. Again, from the, from the ship General Putnam. What you're looking at here is some of the surviving crew members from the General Putnam were put up at inns and taverns because obviously they didn't have a place to stay. Uh, there were there were bedrooms and available in the local what, what local houses there were along the coastline. So the people of Monmouth County put them up uh, while you know uh, while they after they just hauled up a a sinking ship, and uh, that cost money. And John Foreman kept you know, the records of uh, the money monies that were paid out, so that the, the crew members um, were taken care of. And uh, so, as you can see, um, there's a lot of evidence um, that, that uh, uh, contradicts the notion um, that the uh, people of Barnegat were uh, uh, stealing cargo and up to um, bad things. Um, here's another one. So if this is a letter to the uh, circuit court judge of the state of New Jersey from an insurance agent in New Jersey, or excuse me, from New York City. This is a guy who's a marine insurance agent, and he is writing to this judge uh, 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 enthusiastically uh, encouraging the reappointment of John Foreman as rec master. Goes on at great length about his courage, uh, his honesty, about how he, you know, even by accident never hired a dishonest person. And he even goes into how much um, money uh, John Foreman saved uh, his um, customers and that uh, John Foreman did, was doing more good than almost anyone else on the Atlantic coast as far as this person was concerned. Uh, this happened more than once where insurance agents wrote to the presiding judge in New, New Jersey and said, this man is really good at his job. Please reappoint him now that it's time to do so. So uh, once again, nothing in this story holds up. It really seems like a hoax, but that raises the question. If it's a hoax, who did it and why? Well, selling newspapers, that's the obvious thing. It's a hell of a, it's a heck of a story. And uh, I'm sure it probably moved a lot of copies. It was page one story. So um, that was that might have been what it was for. Insurance fraud. You know, that's basically you're, to, you're, you're now telling a very different story about the outcome of the cargoes and ships than what was originally being put forth. So a lot of these ships in those days were um, um, uh, overinsured uh, and um, so, uh, you know, uh, there, there, were, there were shenanigans going on in the maritime insurance industry, and it's, it's remotely possible um, that that's something like that could be going on here. Um, obviously, whoever, whoever had this didn't have anything kind to say about uh, the town of Barnegat. 
uh, and who, so who knows? Maybe somebody had a bad time of it there, and or or just you know with with it, just had an axe to grind against the people of Barnet. Um, it's also you know in in 1834. You know we're now 20 years after the War of 1812, and the rest of the world still tends to look at uh, the new United States of America as a as a bit of a a bit of a uh, outback, you know, lawless you know place. Where uh, you know just um, it's very very uh, uncivilized, and so some of the leading scions of the era and the newspaper publishers and whatnot uh, took it upon themselves to, to, to promote stories about law enforcement and law and order that, that painted a, a better picture of America as a, a nation of, uh, of rule of law. And um, so anyway, so as we say, this whole hoax died down within months, and and the years go by. There's nothing to it anymore. However, what does happen is. Same thing that happened in the United Kingdom, where um, the records of Cornwall and the Seely Islands uh, are held up as the worst uh, rapacious uh, murdering thieves on earth without any evidence to support it. Um, well, you can't have people that are the most rapacious, evil, vile thieves and murderers on earth and not have that get into the, uh, into the popular culture. So both in the, so starting in the UK, you start to have um, plays. There's an opera about records. Um, there's classical music pieces poetry, um, dime novels, uh, paintings. Records are all of a sudden becoming ubiquitous in pop, uh, pop culture in the UK. And after the Barney Pirate story breaks in 1834, the same thing happens uh, in uh, the United States. So um, this is a, an image that's from a um, dime novel about the Barney Pirates. And so once again, you see that there, uh, there's lights showing the inducement and the, the, the sword that imitates the uh, so you hear you see oh, so in other words so all the worst aspects of this story are now in a lot of other places besides newspapers and 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 um, outfits that, um, that, that that traffic in facts and that brings us to 1846 all right um the great storm of 1846 um and uh and in particular uh, the wreck of the john Minturn. this is a very famous shipwreck um, the, uh, there's a speaker uh, uh, on the uh, local history circuit who is doing a Zoom, Zoom, Zoom lectures uh, on the wreck, just on the wreck of the John Minturn. I have not been able to catch up with her yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it. It's a fascinating story. Uh, so 1846, February 15th, massive storm blows ships onto the, sea, onto the sand from Sandy Hook all the way down to Barnegat. Some of those captains steered their ships onto the beach deliberately so as to avoid being blown onto rocks or uh, catching a sandbar where they were far out to, too far out to sea um, to be able to get off uh, the boat and be saved. And um, uh, so um, the, 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 this made national news. Um, uh, a lot of people, about 53 people died in, in, uh, in the Minturn um, and, 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 and some of the others. And so uh, initially the press coverage of this is, is all just, you know, sad, tragic, Oh my God, this is terrible. Um, and, and initially, um, the interesting thing is that the New York papers go out of their way to, to say that the people of Barnegat aren't to blame this time. Um, so here's the New York Herald in 1846. Uh, that, that quote about there be land rats and water rats, land thieves and water thieves. That's from the merchant, that's Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Uh, but uh, here you see uh, there's Squire Platt, the wreck master. Uh, so the idea is that what the newspapers kept saying is that tragedy that happened just now uh, along the Jersey coast, you don't have to worry about the locals anymore because the ones who were murderers and thieves, they all got chased away and the people who are there now, they're okay. Well, of course, there were no murderers and thieves among those people. It was only eight years earlier, um, and, uh, but this is what happened. So now, just by dint of that reference to the past, the hoax of the past is now presented as a fact, all right? And so it's, again, the next thing that happens is, um, uh, 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 you know, Lloyds of London uh, does an article about the John Minturn where they conflate it with all of the 1834 stories where a hundred men with blackened faces went out to the John Minturn in the middle of the night and plundered it and threatened people with their lives. And it's like, it's just an unbelievable abandonment of any facts whatsoever for Lloyds. And the New York papers pounce on that and, uh, and, and all the old accusations start to surface again. This time, um, in, in, in 1834, uh, the local papers just ignored it. Um, but this time they start saying, hey, wait a minute, this is, this, this is not fair, this is not true, this is not right. 
And that catches the uh, attention of the local um, politicians. And so um, Senator Alexander Wurtz from Hunterdon County introduced a resolution to the state Senate uh, calling for the governor to impanel a committee to investigate uh, these uh, um, these shipwrecks and, uh, and and particularly the people of Barney and the uh, infamous quote uh, that he had from um, from that resolution was that um, uh, either the Barney pirates are uh, the most uh, <clears throat> are mostly uh, evil uh, people on earth or else they are a much injured set of men uh, and he framed it perfectly well the governor immediately took action and paneled the committee they met two days later in Freehold. Um, where they, um, we, be we, you know, we believe they, one of the first things they would have done was they would have looked at the papers of John S. Foreman, wreck master, who presided over uh, the salvage of the Minturn. Well, we know that he did because we have one surviving record from the Minturn. The rest are, are uh, whatever other records there were, are not there anymore. Well, that's probably because they, they went with the committee that was investigating this. Well, they went from Freehold up to Sandy Hook. They toured all 10 of the shipwreck sites uh, they uh, interviewed um, survivors, crew members, locals, everybody they could. And in fact, some survivors found out there was an investigation going on uh, who hadn't been asked to attend it, who, who found their way there specifically just to make sure their stories were told. And while it was terribly tragic about the intern, the other stories of the other, some of the other shipwrecks were of incredible courage, uh, of selflessness, of lives being saved, cargoes being saved, ships being saved. And, and, and the people who were on those ships having nothing but the best to say about um, uh, uh, the people of, of Monmouth County. Uh, unfortunately, um, it just wasn't, that wasn't going to help the people of, of the John Minturn. Um, so uh, uh, here is the one and only Minturn paper from the John Foreman records. It's a grisly thing. What this is, this is a list of uh, expenses paid to the county and to different people for the removal of bodies so that they could be buried and given a decent treatment. What are you going to do? Your dead bodies are all over the beach. You can't just leave them there. Uh, and, and, you know, their families are going to expect to come claim them at some point. So, you know, humane treatment even of the, of, of the dead um, was, was an expected thing and it cost money. So every year in those days, Monmouth County incurred thousands of dollars of unreimbursed expenses from uh, dealing with corpses on the beach. Um, and uh, once again, you know, uh, the, these records um, re refute um, in great detail um, what the press had to say about the John Minturn. Um, and so eventually the uh, Senate committee um, came with the following conclusion. We have a report to your excellency that the charges in the resolution under which we act are accordingly to the best of our judgment upon the evidence, each and every one of them untrue. There are no inhuman and guilty actors there to be punished and the state ought to be released from the odium such barbarity. And it largely was. Um, enter Dr. William A. Newell, resident of Monmouth County. He runs for the United States Congress and, and wins. He introduces a legislation that creates uh, the U.S. Life Saving Service. And the idea was that if what the John Minturn episode showed was that the, that the rec master public servant model didn't work, wasn't sustainable. They didn't have enough authority, they didn't have enough training, they didn't have enough resources, they didn't have the right equipment. And uh, so if, if, if federal action at the federal level wasn't going to be taken, that more tragedies like the John Minturn were going to happen. And so out of that came the federally funded U.S. Life Saving Service. And the very first life saving, uh, U.S. Life Saving Service stations were started at Sandy Hook and ran right down the coast where those shipwrecks happened. Um, and uh, so in that regard, this whole Barnegat Pirate story is what led to um, the formation of the U.S. Life Saving Service. And this is where the demise of records starts, because at least certainly in the United States, um, the U.S. Life Saving Service replaces the records uh, almost entirely. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, now there's now there's training, now there's equipment. Um, and uh, uh, and so uh, but in the meantime, uh, there's other things happening. So. Um, you know, we increasingly have the commercial vessels of the day are powered by engines, not by sails. So that means they're better able to stay out of harm's way. Uh, there's incredible uh, improvements in lighthouses and lenses and channel markers and buoys and all those kinds of navigation aids. And, uh, uh, there's advancements in technology. That is a very old Loran C radio direction finder. That's a pre that's a pre GPS GPS. Um, and uh, so that's a 
you know, technology that made it for people. You know, so nobody was looking for a bonfire on the beach to figure out where to go. And, and of course, the uh, life saving service, along with the lighthouse keeping service and the uh, revenue cutter service, those three groups were all formed, uh, combined to form the U.S. Coast Guard. And obviously, uh, this is the group that now coordinates um, rescues of ships as opposed to anybody on um, uh, land or local. So um, there are still records, though. Believe it or not, there are still records. Just of the, and just in, it's sort of there, it's just like there are tow truck drivers for cars that get uh, wrecked. Uh, so there are uh, um, still records who uh, now work mainly the recreational uh, side of, of boating. So these you know people who get drunk and ride you know ride their boat up onto a a, a reef. Well, that boat can't just can't be left there and. Uh, so there are still um, independent parties of uh, people, particularly in the in the Florida Keys area, um, who race and compete with each other to uh, uh, um, see who would be the first to get to a wreck um, and maybe make a little money off it. Um, but they uh, they don't work with um, uh, commercial vessels anymore. So the legacy of wreckers is kind of interesting. Um, uh, you know, in addition to all the pop culture mentions and whatever, you have, um, I mean, you know, they were called land pirates and. Boy, we like our pirates around in the county, don't we? Um, the uh, the uh, mascot of the uh, Red Bank Regional High School is uh, is the Buccaneer. I want. Can you get into? Can you walk into Red Bank Regional High School with a knife in your teeth like that, or does the metal detector trip you up on that? Huh? It's a bit curious. But um, you, then there's this uh, down in Barnegat. Uh, you can tell how sensitive they are about being called land pirates because they have an annual day of a pirates day where they celebrate all things pirates and. It, if you can look at the getup of the people there, um, you can kind of tell that they aren't actually celebrating their heritage of wreckers and land pirates. They are celebrating an entirely different myth of piracy in Monmouth County, and we don't have time to go into that story now because now it's time to go to Pearl Harbor. And uh, <clears throat> the curious story of the two men who sounded the alarm. So there were a lot of movies, uh, not a lot, but there were a number of movies uh, um, and documentaries that have been made about Pearl Harbor. Um, two movies won an Academy Award, um, and uh, we're going to look at uh, the latter of them first. Um, in 1977, a movie called Torah, Torah, Torah. Uh, its pub, its um, producers intended for it to be as, as historically accurate and realistic as it could possibly be. And um, uh, so it, uh, it won the Academy Award for um, special effects. And um, there's about halfway through the movie, there's a brief uh, vignette that tells a little chapter of the, of the Pearl Harbor story that we're going to focus on today. So let's take a look. At the early radar. Where's the damn chow truck? Shut that thing down, will you, George? It's already after seven. Hey, Joe, come here. What do you make of that? I've been watching it for several minutes. It's moving in, fast. I've never seen anything that big. Looks like two main pulses. Hey, Joe, I got it. I make that about 140 miles north, three degrees east. Don't make sense. We got no planes out that far. Joe, we got to contact the information center. Hell, our problem's over at 7 o'clock. Look, the center might make some sense out of it. Okay, suit yourself. By the way, take a look at the clock. Information center. Yeah, I will lot of know, Mac. We're all closed down here. Is that right? Well, hang on a minute. Lieutenant, sir? Lieutenant Tyler. Sir, this is Private Elliott, Opana Point. There's a large formation of planes coming in from the north, 140 miles, three degrees east. Yeah? Well, don't worry about it. The boys at Opana Point must have picked up that flight of B-17s coming in from the mainland. He said not to worry about it. Come on, let's go eat. So. Let's meet Joe and George, the two men in that scene. All right, so the, well, these are both private first class in the United States Army. Joseph L. Lockard from Lackawanna, Pennsylvania. Uh, and he uh, 
enlisted um, and, and joined the army and um, got sent to uh, uh, Hawaii. He was very interested in radios, so he got attached to um, the Signal Corps uh, division there. And uh, uh, he was um, one of the first people who was assigned to the brand new long range detection system that uh, had just arrived in Hawaii. And the other man is uh, George E. Elliott Jr. from Chicago. And uh, pretty much same story, he joined the army um, well before wartime, uh, ended up in Hawaii and heard about this new uh, technology system and wanted to be a part of it and, and uh, got himself transferred in. So if you saw that Torah, Torah, Torah vignette, their version of the story has um, two men operating the uh, single core radio 270B long range detection system. And uh, George is the man who spots the planes Joe is the guy who thinks that they should just go home. George wants to call it in. Joe says, knock yourself out. George makes the call. Joe just kind of is there. So this story seems to make George look like he's the diligent hero of this story and Joe not so much. By the way, uh, this is the SCR. This is the Signal Corps Radio 270B. They, they, they you know, the Signal Corps kept the Signal Corps radio designation for radar systems, specifically so that the, no enemies would, would think that it was a completely different kind of thing from a standard radio. Uh, but it very much was. This was a very new technology. It was not well understood. It was not trusted at all. And these units had just been sent out to some of the uh, US uh, military Pacific bases. So one of these um, got sent to the Philippines. One got sent to Henderson Field in Guadalcanal. One of these ended up um, in Midway. And one of these ended up, uh, and five of them ended up in Hawaii. And um, so you can see that uh, the realism of the Torah, Torah, Torah version of the story is, is quite good, that the, the, the replication of the operations truck and antenna, pretty impressive. Let's go on to our next film, John Ford's December 7th. Now, this is legendary film director John Ford, winner of six Academy Awards, including for this film. This film won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Short Film. It's kind of amazing because it's a bit of a stinker. Uh, it, 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 the censors, the censor bureau ended up cutting it in half. So it's only about 43 minutes long. And that, that's because what they cut was a lot of stuff about how the United States was wholly unprepared and hadn't done anything right ahead of time. And that didn't seem to be the message that the government wanted to send out in a, in a movie that was going to come out while the war was very much playing out. And, um, uh, and, uh, but it was commissioned by the government, the War Department. And uh, the challenge was to be as historically accurate as possible. Um, again, take, take a uh, look at the clocks. And then again, 1943, imagine what George Eliot thought when he was sitting in a movie theater and he saw this. Seven, an incident occurred at a temporary Army aircraft warning station. This station, as indeed the entire aircraft warning system, had officially closed at seven. But Private Joseph L. Lockhart, who had been receiving training here, was granted permission to remain at the station. While listening, he discovered something coming over the detector that alarmed him. He listened intently. Then, certain of his findings, he called the Central Information Center. An inexperienced lieutenant answered the phone. Excuse me, sir, this is Private Lockhart. I believe a large flight of planes are approaching slightly east of north of Oahu at a distance of about 130 miles. Uh, must be our own. We're expecting some B-17s from the mainland. Thank you, sir. This incident, where it acted upon, would have given our forces brief but precious time for defense action and may have considerably affected the events of this fateful day. Regrettably, Private Lockhart's warning went unheeded. It was... So, uh, so you, what we saw there at the end was the clock um, uh, at, uh, um, was at uh, 720. So, you know, so there are these two versions of this same story, there is virtually no aspect um, that agrees. So the, uh, the Torah, Torah, Torah version, there's two men, John Ford's version, one man. Uh, the the uh, one version has uh, George making the call, um, et cetera. The, 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 the times don't agree. Uh, not, nothing adds up. Obviously, the equipment doesn't, but that's that's not to be, uh, that's not George, George. John Ford cannot afford to show a real radar system on his uh, in his movie that the uh, enemy would benefit from. Um, and uh, so that censorship, uh, was, uh, that, so that censorship is itself. And it's entirely possible that, that this whole version of John Ford's thing is, is mixed up entirely because of, of secrecy thing, but that comes, that flies in the face of the charter to um, 
uh, make it the most accurate thing possible. So we have two different, very different versions of this story are out there. What happened next? Well, what happened next is Joe Walker got the Distinguished Service Medal. George Elliott got nothing. Let's make sure we're understanding ourselves. This is not the Distinguished Service Cross. The Distinguished Service Cross is second only to the Medal of Honor and is an award for giving for extraordinary valor in combat under fire. Uh, this is a Distinguished Service Medal. The Distinguished Service Medal is given for doing your job really well at an important time. And so there's a lot of leeway for uh, commanders um, in, in military uh, units to be able to reward people for a job well done that didn't necessarily mean uh, you know, being on the front lines. And um, here we have a picture of uh, Private Locker, now promoted to sergeant uh, in Washington, D.C. You can see the round medal on his chest, so it's very definitely the Distinguished Service Medal, not the cross. Um, and this is, this is actually an autographed photo that was on eBay. He was a bit of a celebrity at the time because he was given sole credit for having spotted the incoming planes. He alone got all the credit. He got the medal. George got nothing. He also got a promotion. Uh, he, they, uh, the Army sent Joe Locker to Fort Monmouth and uh, put him up in, uh, and sent him to officer candidate school, where here you see him getting his uh, lieutenant bars from uh, General Brigadier General Van Dusen, who was the uh, commander of uh, Fort Monmouth at the time. Uh, apologize for that uh, watermark there. This is an image that uh, was in, in some database that went bankrupt, and it's the only image, example of it I've been able to find anywhere. But uh, it's not because we don't pay for our images, just haven't been able to find it. But so here, here it is. Blink and you'll miss it. There's Joe Lockhart in Monmouth County. He came for officer candidate school. He graduated. He got his bars. And from this point, thanks for playing, Joe. You know where they sent him? The Army sent him to the Aleutian Islands. Thanks very much, Joe. You were first here in Hawaii. Then you're involved in something um, fairly um, notorious. And then you get to finish out the war in Alaska. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> But... Um, don't feel sad for Joe because Joe also ended up here uh, in the U.S. Army Signal School, you know, Wall of Fame, honor, whatever. Um, here he is. There's our boy, Joe Lockhart. No George Elliott anywhere in sight. And there's some big names. I don't know all the people here. I haven't looked up every one of these people. You imagine that they're pretty impressive. Look at the company our guy's keeping here. That's Frank Capra. He's the film director of It's a Wonderful Life. S Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, Jr. Huh, who knew? Walt Disney, what are you doing here? Yeah, I guess he heard Dr. Seuss was going to be here and he didn't want to miss out on it. So some really interesting characters on this wall. Uh, and, uh, and Joe Lockhart, but no George Eliot. So what did happen to George Eliot? Well, um, we know that he too got sent to Fort Monmouth um, from Hawaii. Um, but he, that was just a, that was just a, a routine transfer. Um, he, he, he didn't get, um, he didn't get swept into the, to officer candidate school. He applied to OCS and was not accepted. And so he spent the rest of the uh, war bouncing around, um, stateside, um, base units, um, doing various things. And then in 1946, he, when he got out of the army, um, he went, he came back to Monmouth County, um, to live for the, most of the rest of his life. Um, Joe Lockard, when he got out of the army, um, he ended up uh, getting some patents for some technology uh, devices he invented. So he had a very good career after the war, never talked much about Pearl Harbor ever, and, and kept a very low profile. And it has been speculated that some people felt that that's because he was well aware that his role in that, that little moment in time was the guy who said, don't worry about it, don't call it in, don't, you know, don't make a big deal of it. Um, and, that, and that the other guy got no recognition or benefits whatsoever um, that he did. Uh, so how do we know this uh, about George? Well, this is an interesting little story. So there were three different congressional um, or Senate investigations into what happened at Pearl Harbor over the years. And then in, uh, the last in 1946. Well, I don't know too much about the, 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 You can read the reports, but the transcripts seem to be elusive. Uh, but what we see here is, our boy George, now living in West Long Branch, because I guess when he was at um, uh, when he was at um, Fort Monmouth, he met a gal, and they got married, and uh, they, and he came back to settle in her hometown. And um, uh, so you notice that, um, that at the bottom of this story, that George uh, Elliot shows up at this as a surprise witness on the last day, the last day in 1946. So that's really interesting. That's something we want to learn more about. About you know. Um, 
how did he end up getting there on the last day? Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, at any rate, clearly the Torah, Torah, Torah version of the story seems to favor George Eliot above uh, Joe Lockard. Um, uh, and uh, well, there are, maybe there are, are there any other reasons for that? Well, uh, there's um, so there's uh, <clears throat> the fact that um, so over the years uh, when George uh, George Eliot's living in Long Branch, uh, every time September seventh rolls or December seventh rolls around, the press uh, rolls him out again and talks to him again. For, forgotten hero. Uh, so this is from 1959. Um, uh, so this is this is because I, I use this one in this photo. Pretty much about every three four years uh, around December, early December, um, the, the George Eliot story got told again in the local press. Um, but this is the more interesting uh, one, um, and that's um, at the premiere of the movie Tora Tora Tora. Look who's there. George E. Eliot Jr. He's surrounded by two of the men who planned the Japanese attack. Why is George Eliot at the premiere of Torah, Torah, Torah? Hmm. He's not listed as a technical advisor. I've never found anything to suggest that he was involved in it in any way. Um, but uh, I find it fascinating uh, that it really sounds that, that like he took control of his own narrative by showing up at a congressional hearing and making sure that his perspective got put on the record. Uh, and then, um, you know, um, being perhaps asked or who knows, um, involved with uh, uh, the creation of the film and the telling of that story from that particular perspective. Eventually George retired and moved to Florida and the local press forgot all about him pretty much until the day he died. Um, and uh, the last we heard from uh, Joe Lockard it's kind of interesting because um, he stayed out of the press, um, but he had one final um, reunited. Uh, he was reunited with his Pearl Harbor buddies, and um, it turns out Joe Lockard had two friends from Pennsylvania there at Oahu that were good friends of his. So he didn't really know George Eliot at all, but he had three other friends who were good friends. They, were, they had a, a Pearl Harbor reunion in Pennsylvania, uh, as these men are, are octogenarians. Um, George Eliot's not invited nowhere in sight um it's these th it's these uh, other three men so um so it's, it's it's a curious story to say the least and there's a lot of open questions that we're gonna uh, we hope to learn um uh, going forward over time so for example um we don't know for a fact we, we have no evidence to suggest either of these men were in fort monmouth before they came to or, or in monmouth county before they came to fort monmouth um but they might have uh, certainly uh joe locker in the lackawanna he might have gone to the beach and ride the bumper cars you never know uh what was the relationship between them? We, we don't we believe that they didn't hardly know each other at all on December 7th. What we know, for example, is that uh, one of the other Pennsylvania buddies of Joe Lockard, um, they flipped a coin to see who would go out on December 7th and train the new guy. So they didn't have much of a relationship at the time. It's hard to believe they had much of a relationship afterwards, although all the Army people I talked to, we talked about vets and, and people in World War I, they all say that, that people then understood there's a big difference between what men did and what the army did. And it's, tar it's, uh, it's likely that George Eliot understood that, that what happened with, with him and, and Joe was what the army did, not what Joe did. But still, we have no, we have, we've, as far as we know, the two men were never in the same room together at the same time ever again. Um, be nice to know um, that they ever met again or, or had to uh, reunite. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, is there some degree to which, you know, Joe's story varied from George's because he felt like his uh, Pennsylvania buddies deserved more credit. I, 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 I find that one hard to believe. Um, and, uh, and then the last one finally is, um, when will the U.S. Army Signal Corps finally give George Eliot Jr. the recognition he deserves? I mean, if he deserves at least parity with, uh, with what Joe Lockhart got. Um, and we're, we'll be interested to see, maybe if there's still some surviving family members, maybe it's a cause we can get behind sometime. But uh, that is the curious story of Pearl Harbor. And uh, with that, we'll move to the uh, question uh, point, and I will just make this observation. The, the thread that runs through all three of these stories that makes them curious is that, like Seinfeld, they're all a little bit about nothing. So the Edison story, obviously Edison was doing a lot. There's a lot going on, a lot of action, motion, energy, action, activity, whatever. But nothing came of it. Nothing came of it to his eternal consternation. And uh, that's why he didn't talk about it much. He had, he didn't, why, was he, why, would, why would anyone talk about failure uh, when one had experienced so much success? Um, and in the Wreckers case, of course, the whole thing is based on a hoax. 
Uh, it's all based on something that didn't happen. Two different occasions, something that didn't happen is what the story is about. And then um, obviously in uh, Pearl Harbor, um, clearly, uh, you know, the crux of that story is that if the warning had been heeded, then who knows? That's a, a fascinating subject to debate is what would have happened if the army had taken that warning seriously and jumped into action and, and raised the red alert? What would have been different? Um, we won't go into that now unless somebody really wants to during the Q&A part of it. Um, but uh, again, the point is that what Joe Lockhart and George Eliot ended up um, accomplishing was nothing, um, except proving conclusively that the uh, single core radar system was a, a winner and something um, to be trusted, at, which it was um, that point forward to this day. So with that, let's go to the questions. Dana? Hey, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, that was awesome, first of all. Um, but before we get to the q and I just want to remind everybody, Thursday, September 23rd, we have Dr. Richard Veit. He's an archaeologist and a professor at Monmouth University. And he's going to be talking about some of the digs that he's done at um, the Allen House and Marlpit Hall. So it should be pretty interesting to, um, to learn about that, especially we have a lot of stuff going on at Marlpit now. We're finding a lot of new things. So um, it should be exciting. Um, for you, John, let's see, do we have any questions? First of all, I couldn't believe the signaliers. Is that what you call them? Uh, Walt Disney, uh, yeah. Dr. Seuss, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that, uh, that, that's a pretty surprising um, group of people, to say the least. And by the way, you notice who's not there. John Ford is not among them. That's because John Ford was working for the Navy, not the Army. Oh, okay. Okay. And, um, you know, when you were talking about the wreckers and you were showing some of those hoax, um, the hoax articles, you're sure that there was no colony on the moon in 1835? I mean, you're sure about that? Um. As, as, as what we'd like to say is that we have been unable to come up with any evidence to support that story. Okay. <laughs> but, so no, we cannot be certain. There might have been a colony in the moon. Maybe they got the story right. Never know. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, I know. I come across some pretty uh, sketchy things too. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for John tonight? Any questions? No, we have a lot of people still on and nobody's coming up with any questions. Um, Beth is telling us that she said her dad took her to see Tora Tora Tora. He was a lifelong Freehold resident and he survived the Pearl Harbor attack as a sailor on the battleship Nevada. His name was Herbert Spitzner Sr. Oh, that's pretty amazing. That is very amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Debbie is saying, no, you cannot walk into Red Bank Regional with a knife in your teeth. So <laughs> it just public service announcement there. Yeah, I thought, I thought as much. Mm. Um, All right. Yeah, any questions for John? Okay, how did the records from the wreckers end up at M MCHA? Geez, well, um, that, that would be a question for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a question for me. Uh, well, we just, uh, we probably just got it in as a donation. I actually don't remember the year, Frank, um, but I could look that up for you and get the donor information for you. That's actually one of my favorite um, collections. It's the uh, Samuel yeah, Foreman yeah. papers. It's just amazing to, to see yeah, all that. Yeah, those documents tell some harrowing stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just, uh, it's very cool to see that, you know, they list everything that was on the ship and it tells so much information. You know, these little things, like you don't realize it helps you put kind of a, a well, you know, John, it helps you to put a, a sketch together. That's why ledgers are some of my favorite um, things that we have here, because it just really describes, you know, it describes the town. It might just, it, it t talks about the fabrics that were sold in the store and the kinds of food and, um, you know, the people that came in and bought it, the things that were being built. It's, it's just, you know, it's an amazing source of information. Um, Charles is asking, did more wrecks occur in Monmouth? So yeah, go ahead. You can. Uh, yeah. Did Go ahead. Did more wrecks occur in Monmouth than uh, other counties? Is that the question? I don't know. I think he was just asking if there's more than like like the Minturn, basically. So yes, the answer would be yeah. We definitely had. Oh, oh yes, wrecks. absolutely. We have yeah. there, some there, pretty there. famous ones too, right? You want to talk about the the two big ones? Um, which two big ones? Well, yeah, uh, the new era, right? Oh, yeah, the new yeah. The, uh, well. Yeah, the, the answer of your question, of course, is that that, um, that, that the reason that I was uh, pointing out that the entrance is to New York Harbor, one of the five most shipwreck-prone 
shipwreck prone areas in all of North America. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and the reason for that um, is because of uh, the shelf. So if you've ever looked at a, a satellite map of the Jersey Shore uh, in you know, Monmouth County, Ocean County area, you see that the, uh, uh, the coast is, uh, the, the, the water is fairly shallow and then it, and then it deep goes off a shelf into a very deep um, the deepening. Um, and, uh, you know, in the era of sail, ships had to sail, stay on the right side of that, of that uh, shelf um, because um, there would be sandbars that could form overnight that you couldn't see. So if you came too close to shore, you could run aground on a sandbar very, very easily. And that's what so many of these shipwrecks were, were ships that were um, either blown off course and simply didn't have the ability to turn, you know, so, um, you know, uh, the, the earliest um, uh, article about records in New Jersey actually was uh, uh, happened in Cape May, and it happened to a ship that was trying to get into New York Harbor, and it was at the tip of New York Harbor by Sandy Hook when the wind blew it out to sea and blew it south, and it ended up wrecking off Cape May. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the number of, uh, of shipwrecks um, is, is uh, extraordinary, and there's a lot of them, a lot of them where it's, no records exist whatsoever. Um, and uh, by the way, that incident in Cape May, um, uh, apparently a lot of the locals there decided to help themselves to some of the stuff that would floated in the water and, and floated up on the beach. Um, and that was one of the more negative stories um, at the time. But again, very, very different from the hoax article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't something that was just particular to Monmouth County. I mean, it kind of happened all over the world. It, well, it, it, it very much, and, and, in, and in very different ways. So in the Caribbean, for example, some of these Spanish galleons um, would sink, you know, just, just laden with, um, you know, coins and gold bars and silver or whatever. Well, there were Native Americans, you know, indigenous tribes um, in the Caribbean islands, Carib Indians, um, who were free divers, could hold their breath and dive down to the ocean floor. And so they were among the early wreckers who would go after a treasure that was on the ocean floor in, aboard ships. Um, so, uh, like I say, Cornwall, the Scilly Islands, uh, uh, the coastline of France, Calais, Rouge uh, is a, is a um, wreckers area. Uh, uh, clearly, um, the, the Capes, Cape of Good Horn, Cape Hope. Um, you know, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's the wreckers areas all around the world, mm -hmm. uh, or at least there were up until uh, technology uh, made them irrelevant. Okay, um, we have a question. You mentioned the county had to bear great costs at time for wrecks. Was there a tax on wrecks to offset those costs? Never. Um, and for example, uh, one of the accusations that came out of the Minturn story was that uh, what these horrible people in Monmouth County were asking the families of, of uh, uh, people who died in that disaster to cough up $10 to reclaim the bodies of their loved ones. Well, that was just another thing made up out of whole cloth. Um, but the truth was that the Monmouth, Monmouth County annually did have thousands of dollars of unreimbursed expenses from having to deal with uh, uh, corpses from shipwrecks um, and, and using pay, having to pay volunteers um, to, to, uh, to take care of them. Um, but what happened with the, in, the, in the wake of the Minturn disaster was, in fact, that if a family came to claim a body, um, it, it was assessed whether they were able to make a payment. And if they could make a payment, they were asked to pay $3. And if they couldn't pay, they were not asked to pay anything. So as usual, there's a huge discrepancy in uh, the accusations and allegations and what really happened. But though there was never any kind of a, of a shipwreck tax, the county just took a loss. Mm -hmm. and, and the state as well. Um, Claire is asking what the names of the African Americans are in the signal ear panel. I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I was solely focused on uh, um, uh, this particular story. Um, I'm, I, I, there looks like there's a Native American uh, amongst them. So I am, I am keen to look up some of those other stories when I get a chance. I have just been to this. I haven't had a chance to. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I know you'll get to it. <laughs> All right, Claire, we'll keep you posted on that. And uh, just to wrap up, I I'm, was thinking about something that I said. I said, oh, you know, the two... Um, Shipwrecks that come to mind are the New Era and the Morrow Castle, but I, that's not really, I mean, that would be like an ocean disaster, but it wouldn't necessarily, would that, that wouldn't really be a shipwreck because it wasn't, I mean, it did land on the shore, but it wasn't like wrecked on a sandbar or something. And then, right, well, the what would you say? Would you say that's a shipwreck or that's a, an ocean disaster no, that... that Oh, they're both they're both they're both shipwrecks it's just that the Morro castle came after the age of wreckers when um, when there was a coast guard 
Right, right. And uh, yes. where, with the, but the new era, the new era would have very much definitely have been salvaged if, if it could have been um, by John Foreman. By, uh, but we, I didn't see any records, uh, and, and that may have been after John Foreman's time. Uh, no, I was just wondering on how to classify it. You know, would you say it's just a shipwreck or it's an ocean disaster? Or are they the same thing? I don't know. Oh yeah, I, I look. If you can, if you can, if you can stand on the beach and see it, it's a it's a shipwreck. All right, two big ones. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for uh, your questions and for showing up tonight. And John, it was awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm happy to. Sorry I went a little long. And that's okay. We'll have to have you back. I want to anytime. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.